Okay, morning. <coughs> So let's uh, talk about the bearing today, okay? And uh, we'll make use today in the next lecture. We'll look at uh, uh, the idea of a select uh, selection of a bearing, okay? Yeah. So now uh, the objective is to be able to identify uh, different bearing types and their applications. So I'll use the PowerPoint to introduce you the different types of the bearing, okay? and their applications. Okay? And then uh, we'll look at uh, uh, the uh, loading and the life of the bearing and how they are related. Okay? So this is probably going to be today's, uh, today's lecture. Okay? Alright, so this is the diagram we've seen there. And so we are still hiding in this corner over here. Okay? So 10,000 years ago, you know, our ancestors noticed the loading right, uh, moves much faster. And then uh, 20,000 BC, the Syrian find that they can use this mechanism to build the uh, pyramids, right? And this is uh, basically inevitable to lead to a nowadays bearing, basically, right? If you just uh, put this horizontal one into a circle, and that's essentially the bearing, okay? And bearing is uh, becoming a very a large industry, okay, has been used in many, many different applications. Okay. So some of the key components and the features for bearing, <coughs> okay, uh, first the ball size, okay, so this is the uh, key diam parameter here, okay, and then you have this width, okay, that's also a key parameter you see in the catalog, and then you have this outer diameter, okay, so that's another key parameter. Okay. And then you also have this corner radius. Okay, if you recall that, uh, the corner radius defined by the catalog actually uh, put as a constraint for the fillet of the shaft shoulder, right? Yeah. So the bearing consists of basically inner ring and outer ring, and then there's this cage. Okay, so this is the cage, and then the balls here. here okay. Yeah. And you can call this the shoulder. Okay and then this uh, retainer, okay, the cage or separator. Okay. Uh, when you mount the bearing on the shaft, okay, uh, there are actually basically three different kind of loading conditions. The first is so-called the radial load. Okay. So the radial load is the force that's applied towards the direction mm -hmm. radius the bearing. Okay. So it's a vertical basically to the shaft, right? And the arrow indicates basically the loading zone. Okay, so it's not even a distribution, but it's uh, uh, basically perpendicular here, right? And you also have a thrust load, and particularly you see that if you're using helical gear, okay, or bevel gear, so the thrust load or axle load is along the shaft direction, okay, and uh, the red one here indicate the loading zones of the thrust here, right? Yeah. <coughs> Uh, this is the most common one, particularly if you design uh, a gear or a helical gear. So you have a combination of this radial load and the thrust load. So the bearing is supposed to take both of the bear both of the load here and then transmit it to the ground, right? Yes, through some mechanism. And the red one here, right? It's the loading uh, loading zone, and the direction of the loading zone is neither perpendicular to the shaft or along the shaft. It's actually a certain angles, right, to the shaft. Okay. Okay. So uh, the bearing that you pick right, should be uh, essentially to accommodate the different kind of loading condition that we see there. Okay. So then let's look at the different type of bearings. Okay. So we can define uh, the type of bearing using this this uh, three different uh, two different ways of this. This is just basically see the type of loading bearings. Uh, we look at this, this is called ball bearing. This is cylindrical uh, roller bearing, and this is the taper uh, roller bearing, right? So the name is pretty uh, straightforward. This is a ball, this is a cylindrical roller, and this is a taper. So the, uh, the shape here is a taper shape, okay? Yeah. And you can also have so-called spherical roller. So 
the uh, the roller inside here, the surface. Okay, the surface is the surface is basically a part of the spherical surface. Okay, so, and this is a needle bearing. So the bearing itself it's pretty uh, small in terms of the the diameter. Okay, but generally it's a bit of a longer than um, than euro. Okay, uh, there's a reason for this, and then I'll mention that so shortly. So. Now you can also uh, uh, categorize using this this type here called roller uh, rolling bearing type is called using as a radial ball bearing, okay, or radial roller bearing, or axial ball bearing, or axial roller bearing, okay. So radial, this is radial, right? So your shaft is mounted in inside here, okay, and the same thing. Uh, then the shaft over here is probably mounted, okay. Uh, inside here, okay, yeah. So uh, your top one probably is a uh, fixed, okay, and then it's the uh, sorry the bottom one is probably fixed, and then the bottom the top one here will rotate at the same time as the shaft, okay, yeah. So basically, define uh, categorize it, classify it into a uh, uh, axial direction, a radio axial direction, and a radial direction, okay. Yeah. Okay, so let's look at the ball bearing here first, okay, yeah. Uh, the rolling balls between basically uh, races, okay, the transfer of load here. Okay. Uh, the ball bearing typically can uh, take radial and a little bit maybe of some thrust load, okay, it's not as much as the radial load, right? Yeah. A very typical example you will see in the catalog is called a single row uh, deep groove ball bearing, okay, so SRDG um, B, okay. So this is the most typical ones that you will probably use uh, for the design project, and then I think this is enough, okay? Yeah. So even if you use a uh, helical gear, there's uh, some thrust load. Uh, if you look at the, uh, if you look at the uh, catalog for some ball bearings, they're able to take certain <coughs> amount of thrust load, thrust load, okay? Yeah. So when you uh, assemble the ball bearing, there are two different ways of assembling it. Uh, this is called Conrad assembly. So basically, uh, you move this uh, inner ring, okay, away from its center, and then you started to put the balls into it, okay, and uh, this is probably as much as you can put, and then uh, move this uh, piece back into the center so the ball will be evenly uh, distributed along this inner ring, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, the other way you do is it's called to use a fading slot. So you cut a cut a slot at here, so then you started to put the balls into it. So and apparently, uh, this one here, well, you can uh, put in more balls than this one here, right? And more balls basically means you can uh, carry a more uh, load than this one, okay? But however, because of the failing slot, and guess what? You have a, a stress concentration, okay? Yeah. <coughs> uh, there's another important part of the bearing is a seal, okay? Or our shield and the shields, Se the shields and the seals, okay? So uh, the purpose of uh, the shields or seals is this protection, right? From uh, uh, contaminations of external, basically, uh, dirt or uh, some other stuff, foreign stuff, into the <coughs> uh, raceways. Okay. Uh, the seal, uh, the shields generally they're, they're steel stampings. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the uh <coughs> the shields are not completely actually, uh, uh, you know, basically seals this in outside from the inside. So there's a little bit of gap right here. Okay. Uh, when you look at the catalog. Uh, they're often as a prefix number indicating what kind of a shield that you have. For example, you can see a ZZ, it actually basically means a double shield like these kind of things here. Okay? Yeah. <coughs> so if you use a double seal, so if the, the the notation is probably DDU, if a DU is basically means a single seal, uh, that's usually nitro rubber, okay? And that it touches, okay, very little bit to the inner ring, okay? So basically, uh, it, it will cause a little bit of friction when the inner ring is rotating. Uh, that actually will limit the speed, okay, of this uh, uh, of this bearing here, okay? There's, uh, there's always a maximum uh, operating temperature, okay? And this one here, uh, use the symbol called VV, it's double seal, but it's a non-contact, okay? It's a non-contact. So, uh, basically, it will have a higher speed than the previous one, okay? Uh, but, you know, uh, it, it's not uh, water resistance, right? Because of a little gap there. 
Uh, there's another ball bearing, it's angular contact ball bearing. Okay, so for this one here, uh, angular contact basically means uh, if you explode this portion out, okay, explode it out, uh, the actually the contact between the ball and the surface of this uh, outer ring right here it's actually point to point contact okay if you explode them out okay so when you have a two surfaces in contact with each other right uh, at over there it's a point contact so that contact point you can always draw from a center to the contact point then there's a certain angle okay at, uh, with respect to the vertical line that angle is called an, uh, uh, a contact angle okay it's contact angle so you know uh, when you when you have two surfaces in contact then uh, when you apply a force, so the force basically is acting along that contact line there, right? The action reaction. So depends on the contact angle. As you can imagine, essentially, right, the amount of the thrust force that this angular contact bearing can take is going to be different. Okay, so the higher contact angle, apparently which one has higher? This one has higher here, right? Yeah, will be able to take more thrust load. So that's basically for angular contact bearing, then you, you can use it to uh, uh, carry the thrust load. Okay? Uh, but unfortunately, you can only use it to carry in one direction. Okay? So basically this direction, right? Okay? You can put a, 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 a mount the angular contact bearing and then trying to accommodate the thrust load in this direction. So if that's the case, then guess what? You will have a, a disassembling of this uh, bearing, okay? If the load is not, if the bearing is not installed properly, okay? Yeah. <coughs> okay. So that's angular be uh, contact bearing. Uh, angular contact bear uh, ball bearing generally will be used in a pair. So because of actually that previous picture, the shortcoming there. So you can use it as a back to back like this, and you can also use it called face to face, okay? Or you can use it uh, called the tantum DT. So basically, this is a two direction, right? You're you're using two, so you can accommodate a thrust load in this direction, right? Double that capacity. Okay, yeah. And this two, right? Uh, basically, you can use it, right, to accommodate uh, a thrust load in both directions, right? In both directions. Okay, yeah. But there is a sh a, a difference though, right? Uh, like this diagram shows here. Now this is a DB. Okay, this is a DF. Okay, so basically, what's a DB DF? DB is a back to back. DF is face to face. Okay, so this is a DB back to back. This is a face to face. So the if you look at the back to back at this one here, right? Uh, you draw the contact angle. Okay, and you you end up with this kind of a triangle uh, structure out of here, right? But for this one here. Uh, this is the face to face, so that angle is drawn here like this. So basically, you can you can think of it as very intuitive. And for this one here, right? And uh, this is like because your your gear your 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 shaft will be fixed at here. Okay, will, will the shaft will be mounted uh, inside here. So it's like a, you have a very big guys you know sitting on the shaft here. Now, if somebody w trying to let's say tilt the shaft at the other end. Right, so guess which one is more rigid or more stiff to the tilting moment? DB or DF? DB, right? Yeah. So the DB will be more resistive <coughs> to the tilting, right? It's pretty intuitive. You know, you have a, a thin guys like me. You know, it's can tip it over easily, but then you have a t the big guys, right? So you use this, okay, uh, basically according to the situation, but it does provide a little bit uh, of flexibility for this DF. Okay. If your uh, radial load carry is, you know, is not enough, so you can consider double row bearing, okay, so that gives you, basically you can carry heavier radial load and also heavier uh, thrust load, okay, yeah. And a double row bearing, you know, to get uh, in, in one, it's probably more compact than a two uh, single row bearing. Okay. Yeah, so uh, there's also another type called self-aligning double row bearing. So this one here essentially uh, to accommodate the possible deflection of the of the shaft. So when you have a deflection shaft, 
then there are probably some misalignment. And with this kind of bearing, then you will be able to come with a certain amount of angle of uh, deflection, okay, and uh, basically uh, providing this uh, self-aligning, okay. And this is the the thrust load, uh, thrust bearing here. So your your shaft is mounted uh, essentially uh, in this way here. So it takes the axle load, right? This guy takes the axle load, but it doesn't take uh, the uh, what do you call that? Uh, the radial load. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the uh, for this kind of thrust bearing. Uh, you can uh, you, you actually to achieve a degree of external aligning ability. Uh, you see when you see the bearing, you get you often see is there's there is a, a spherical seat over here. Okay, so when you mount it, okay, uh, it provides a little bit of, of flexibility in terms of the alignment. Okay, basically when you I mean you mount it onto the seat. Okay, so that's uh, one advantage of having this uh, spherical seat. Roller bearing. So there are different roller bearing, and it all depends on uh, the shape of this uh, inner ring and the outer ring and here. Okay. Yeah. So first of all, the roller bearing provides a greater contact area than the ball bearing, which means it can carry more radial load. Right. Okay. Uh, and the second of all, okay, there is one uh, one thing when you design a shaft, when you when you use a bearing to support it, one thing you always need to consider is to accommodate this uh, uh, thermal expansion, okay, the temperature. So, uh, how do you accommodate that then? So, this is just roller bearing here uh, is one basically uh, option here. Bec because why? Let's for example this one here. It, it is free to float, right? For this outer ring right here is free to float along along this direction right here. Okay. So, if your shaft is mounted uh, in, the, in at here, and if there is a as thermal expansion, so it can it basically you can move together, right? And you either read it here with this flexibility. Okay, so that's a ruler bearing here. Uh, depends on the flange. Okay, it basically depends on how the flange is arranged here, and the uh, prefix for this ruler bearing indicate basically the flange type of this. For example, if you see a ruler bearing uh, with the naming star with N. So which basically means it's this shape. So the inner ring has two flanges here, and the outer ring has no flange like this, right? If you use NU, so that basically means this guy here, okay? Yeah. So there are different uh, uh, naming type here. So, so this guy is NJ, right? You can see the difference between the NU and N. This one is NF, okay? See the difference, right? Yeah. Was that, was that right? Yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah. Now, when you have a, a flange at here, so you actually the roller bearing is able to take a, lo a certain amount of a f uh, thrust load in which direction? In this direction, like this. Okay. Yeah. But uh, if you look at the previous case, uh, like this one here, right? Yeah. And uh, basically, you can't take uh, too much of uh, thrust load, right? Taper roller bearing, okay. So basically, the ruler has a little bit uh, a tapered angle, okay. And because of that, you have again uh, the concept called angle of a concept, uh, angle of a contact. So when you draw the lines, okay, all the way to here, they all converge to one single point, okay. So like the perspective point, and that particular angle here is called angle of a contact, okay. Typically, they are within uh, 15 degrees to uh, 45 depends on uh, depends on the type. Standard is between 15, 7, 17. Medium is 17, 24. And steeper one is 24, 45. Right? Yeah. And the higher contact angle, then you can carry the higher uh, thrust load capacity. Okay? Yeah. But lower radial load. Okay. So, but you can only c you can only take in one direction though huh? for the thrust load. A double roller, double row spherical ball bearing, and that the, that's again, you know, uh, you can take uh, both ways, uh, both directions of thrust load. Okay, then you can carry uh, more uh, than a single rows. Okay, and it can, this one here can you can be used to adjust for certain amount of uh, misalignment to one to twenty, one to two point five degree. Okay. 
Again, this is a needle bearing, right? Uh, the needle bearing essentially the the ball the the rotor right here is very fairly s uh, slim, okay? Uh, but it can carry actually a uh, very high uh, radial load. Uh, the, the generally you pick this one uh, probably due to your space requirements. So let's say if you uh, vertically, right? You don't have that much of a space, but you 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 need to carry this much of a radial load, mm -hmm. right? Then you can consider a needle bearing out of here. Okay? Yeah. So, bearing part numbering. This is a more of a basically engineering things here when you uh, you don't need to basically always flip to the category, you know, to uh, find out some of the information here. By looking at the bearing number, okay, and you'll be able to tell most of the information, okay? Uh, when you look at the bearing, so this is what generally the 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 catalog give you. There's a per, there are prefixes, there's the basic part numbers, and then there's the suffixes. Okay, uh, it's very hard to remember all the prefixes and the suffixes. There are too many variations. Okay, but the the middle one, the ba basic part number, and that actually has a certain rule so you can follow. Okay, uh, it's a pretty straightforward. Okay, uh, they are controlled by this ISO standard for the part number. Okay. Uh, the basic part number is what this looks like here. Okay, what this looks like. It consists two uh, groups. Okay, two groups. One group. This is a one group. Another group is this one here. Okay. So this group right here indicate to generally indicate the ball size. You know how big the inner ring is. And this group right here, it kind of indicates it's uh, what type of bearing it is. Okay, and what's this so-called dimension theories? Okay, dimension theories. I'll look, give you a diagram. Uh, you'll see that. See, for example, uh, when you look, when you see a six, and you know this is actually a single row deep ball bearing. Okay, yeah. And when you see a zero five, and you will know what the ball size is. Okay, that's basically the idea, right? So I'll give you some specific example here. Uh, you. Not necessarily you always have, let's say, a one, two, six numbers or five numbers. Sometimes you have a three numbers only. Okay, some some of the numbers are going to be neglected. So when you see this one in here, so you see the, uh, this one here, it actually, this the last one, one, zero, nine. Okay, that's basically only uh, three digits. Okay, the, the last two numbers represent the ball size. And they are actually essentially the same as the actual ball size, one millimeter up to nine millimeter. Okay, that's a three digits. Okay, when you see a four digits there, then the last two number, okay, is the ball size. And then for the last two numbers, starting from zero zero to zero three, uh, there's not much of a rule, but you can remember this: zero zero corresponding to ten millimeter, zero one is twelve, zero two is fifteen, and zero three is seventeen millimeter. Okay, yeah. Then starting from zero three. Okay, then you have a pretty good idea now. So all you need to do is you time the last two number by five. Okay, and that's going to be the ball size. Was that good? Yeah. So for example, 0 0.5 here is you have a ball size of 25 uh, millimeter. But this is only up to 480 millimeter. Mm -hmm. So when it's 96 uh, times five, give you 480 millimeter. Okay. Yeah. So for those that is greater than 480 millimeter. So then, what do you do is you can just use a slash. You'll see that you have a slash and then the actual value. Okay, so those are pretty big bearings, right? Yeah. Is that clear? Yeah. So 78 centimeter. That's uh, really big, right? Yeah. Now this is a diagram. Okay, in the, in the catalog. Uh, generally, this is taken from SKF, okay, as a guideline regarding the basic uh, uh, the basic uh, numbering of the uh, bearing here. So, as you can see, as, as remember, I said there are two groups, right? One group here is a, is a t uh, tells you the type of the bearing and dimension series, and the other group tells you the ball size, right? The bore dimension. So you look at this one here. What what's the first group? The first group here, the first digits, right, comes from here. Okay, first digit comes from here. So you see the first digits, uh, they have a 
uh, all the names here. When you when it's one, this is actually a spherical double row bearing, okay? When it's a six, this is what I call that uh, basically uh, the single row deep ball bearing, right? If it starts with a seven, this is angular contact, okay? Yeah. If you start with the N, it's the roller bearing, right? Cylindrical roller bearing, okay? Yeah. Dimension series comes from two numbers. Uh, one comes from this one, the width, and the other comes from the outer diameter. So these two groups determine this dimension series. I'll give you another diagram. We'll, we'll, we'll have a little bit of uh, uh, ideas of what's the combination, what's the effect of the combination in here. But this number comes from the width. This number comes from the outer diameter. Okay? Yeah. So if this, you see this number here, so 0 to 5, so which means the higher this number is, which means the bearing is the wider, right? So this width is this width, right? It's this width, so the wider. And this number comes to outer diameter is this. And uh, funny thing is it doesn't start from 0, it starts from 8. So 8, 9, then 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So I can't see the higher, but you can see the trend as this goes up. Um, you have a bigger outer diameter, okay? Yeah. And I'm not sure where, why they use 8, 9 starting from there, okay? So that's basically uh, the idea of this uh, uh, numbering right here, okay? So let's take a look at the example like this one here. So when you see uh, NU316 and then WC3, so most of the things you can tell I mean, probably except those WC3 things, okay? So NU, you look at the previous one there, you look it up, N and U, so okay, so this basically is a, uh, it's a cylindrical roller bearing, right? Yeah. And 3 out of here is the dimensional series, and 16 out of here is the ball size. Because you look at the NU, if you look, it goes up here, right? Where's the 3? Three sixteen. Uh, yeah, there's a 03, that's right. Yeah. So this guy here, right? Yeah. So the exactly that the the B, so it basically zero and then neglect it. Okay? And the three is this three out of here, the outer diameter. Okay? Yeah. So that's how you can look it up basically if you have this piece of a piece of paper handy. You know, you can always tell most of the information uh, based on the numbering here, right? Yeah. And those WC3, uh, this one here, generally, I think the different manufacturer probably will have a different uh, uh, suffix or uh, prefix, okay? But mostly, uh, probably will be sticking to the ISO standard, okay? Yeah. So, uh, if it's a 16, what would be the ball size? 80, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So this is the comparison of the dimension series. Okay, dimension series. Remember, dimension series come one number comes from the width, the other number comes from the outer diameter, right? So the first number is the width. The higher the 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 higher the width number, you can see that it's wider, right? And the second number is the diameter series. So if I looking just at one group, fix the waist dimension, but changing the di the outer diameter d, and look what happened to not only the outer diameter is is bigger, right? But also what the waist is also bigger, okay? For under one single uh, waist series, okay? Yeah. So uh, when you compare the uh, when you compare the waist you need to compare basically uh, in with uh, zero. Yeah, you need to compare basically. Let's say if I compare, I, I compare zero zero with one zero. So basically, you see the second digits is the dimension. It's the diameter, outer diameter, right? The first digits is the width. If you fix the outer diameter, zero, 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 and then change the width, zero, one, two, 
3. So apparently you can see the width is getting bigger, right? Yeah, so that's how, that's the effect of the combination between this width and the outer diameter D. Is that good? Yeah. So just remember the first is the width, the second is the outer diameter, and the combination of that, there's a trend, right, in terms of the, uh, uh, the dimension. So let's say uh, this one here, this is 0, 2, first two digits is the dimension series, last two digits is the ball size, in this case 10 times 550, right? Uh, this is from NSK catalog. It's a similar, basically, diagram. Uh, but the catalog one, the good thing is, it's this. Uh, it draws a sort of a, a network here that tells you uh, for their manufacturer, deep groove ball bearing exists under what, what dimension series. See what I'm saying? Right? Yeah. So that's a quick guide is when you pick uh, uh, ball bearings from that uh, manufacturer. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So uh, selection of a ball bearing. Okay. Uh, selection ball bearing is it's basically it depends on a few things that are here. Okay. First, the arrangement of bearing, and then you look at the direction magnitude of external force. Okay. You look at the uh, the uh, the life requirement. Essentially, how many cycles you want it to run? Okay. You also need to look at the stability, the speed suitability of the bearing. Okay. Uh, there is always upper limit of the speed. There is a necessary radio and an axial clearance. Okay. Those are also need to be taken into consideration. Uh, environmental condition, compensation for misalignment. So those things is a, it's a combination of the different things, right? In terms of the application. Okay. Uh, in our case, mostly what we consider is. Uh, uh, the force set here, okay, and the life, okay. So those are pro uh, pretty much what we're going to look at in terms of selection of the bearing, okay? Yeah. Okay. So how do we select the bearing then, right? Uh, we know that the bearing is going to carry a certain load. If it's a radial load, then there is a certain compressive stress, and there is a contact stress between the bearing and the wrist width. Okay, risk with surface. Okay. So, but the contact stress, okay, uh, when we designed the gear, we used a so called herzing stress, right? The AGMA modified as a herzing stress and then use it as a contact stress. So, we consider basically the cylindrical contact for the, uh, for the gear. But for bearing, it's not that simple actually, okay. Uh, so far, as, as the textbook suggested, there is no very uh, systematic way of uh, basically a mathematical model f to model this uh, contact stress for the bearing. Okay, so then what we're going to do is we there's a, the basically empirical equation set here in terms of this uh, selection of bearing for the contact stress. Okay, yeah. so for safe design, okay, we wanted to prevent this uh, fatigue failure. Now this is essentially uh, the tricky part here. Okay, yeah, so. Uh, how do we define uh, the bearing life and how do we define the failure of the bearing thing, right? Uh, the Tim King company, which set up a uh, lot of standard for the bearing, so it says uh, the failure essentially, you consider the failure when you see spalling or painting of the area of a 0 0.01 square inch. So that's basically. Of, of course, you probably won't be able to, to, to see that you don't because you don't uh, take it off and uh, see it uh, uh, that frequent, right? But as long as as it is complete defined as as long as you see this much of uh, uh, area of a spalling or painting, okay, on the surface, then you consider that as a fatigue failure. You have a failure essentially, okay? And American Bearing Manufacturer Association standard states that. When the first evidence of fatigue appears, so like I said, nothing. So, what is the first evidence of fatigue appears then, right? So that's basically the idea. What's the first evidence? This is the first evidence. Okay, so it's basically, basically I think it's when you when you uh, notice that. Okay, that's the first evidence. So it's, of course, it's gonna basically getting bigger and bigger, right? That's basically what we call the spawning at here. Okay, yeah. 
So understand this now, and then uh, I'll use um, you know instead of a draw, just write write this one here. Uh, I'm gonna how do you exit this? Okay. So I'm gonna write uh, using the border here just to write a few concepts. Okay. And then we talk about the bearing life right here. Okay. Yeah. So selection, selecting bearing is all about the life. When the, when the bearing is under certain load, it's inevitable to last probably a certain amount of cycles. That's the life we're talking about here. And bearing life is a probability concept, is actually okay. It's a probability concept. So uh, you cannot uh, specifically say, okay, the bear the bearing uh, will last, you know, exactly this much of life. So uh, it's often it's about the probabilities. Okay, here's a group of bearing, the same kind of bearing. For this group of bearing, uh, how many, how much percentage of the bearing will feel, essentially after a certain amount of life, under a certain amount of load? Okay, that's the idea here, right? Yeah. And uh, so the definition of the of the uh, of bearing life is is this, okay? So we call that the rating life. Of a group of a bearing, okay. it's defined as the number of revolutions, okay, the number of revolutions, okay, that, okay, ninety percent of of that group, okay will achieve okay will achieve uh, or exceed the failure criteria I'm oh. oh, no, sorry will both or six uh, so the keyword before the failure criteria develop. Okay, so that's basically the, the definition of this uh, bearing knife. <coughs> so what does that mean? Uh, before the failure criteria develop, that's the two statements that I just showed you in the slides. Or you can see that before you see a 0.01 square inch of a spool of painting, or before you see the first evidence of the failure based on ABMA, right? So, but it has to be 90% of that group will achieve exceed, okay, uh, before the failure criteria develop. So this is actually often in time we call that L10. So because 90% will achieve, which means basically only 10% of that will fail, right? So this is essentially called L10 life, or uh, out of a uh, out of a North America, you sometimes you can see that it's called also called B10 life. Okay, so when you see when you were talking about the life of the bearing, so you need to bear in mind is we're talking about is a probability concept. It's an L10 life. Okay, it's L10 life. It's not a, a you know just a single bearing life. Okay, yeah, and so. Now here basically comes from uh, the next one here is so what's the relationship between this bearing load okay and this rated life this rating life right or L10 life basically okay so it's a basically you can uh, consider as a reliability is if it's a L10 10% of a fuel it's like a 90% of reliability essentially right yeah So then what people do is uh, they, they do experiments. So this very simple experiment, okay? And they, uh, 
apply certain load for a group of a bearing, they apply certain load, right? And they observe, uh, you know, the results of the, the bearing, you know, how many number of cycles, how many number of uh, basic revolutions the bearing will feel for each individual of them, right? Then you look at, okay, for this group of bearing, 90% uh, of them will be able to uh, achieve, let's say, 5 times 10 to the power of 5 number of cycles, right? And that basically is the rated life for this group of uh, bearing under this amount of uh, load. Is that okay? So you do different ones there, and then you can plot this out. And uh, interestingly, when you plot this out and you use a uh, log log scale, okay, it turned out to be a, s a straight line, more or less. Okay, more or less straight line. Okay, yeah. So the higher load, of course, you have a, a uh, you have you the higher load, and you have a the lower uh, life here, right? It's pretty natural. Okay, yeah. So that's the uh, the, the diagram here. It's a straight line. So it's a, if it's a straight line here, so which means F times L and one over A and equal to a constant. Okay, so that's the uh, basically a linear approximation okay, of this bunch of data that you can obtain at here. <coughs> so then out of this whole uh, bunch of data at here, and there's one particular one which generally you see that in the catalog. Okay, so from catalog, and there <laughs> is this so called catalog rating life. Okay, catalog rating life. It's not just the rating life, it's the catalog rating life. Okay, so the catalog rating life. It's also an L10 concept, and that life generally is a 10 to the power of 6, if you look at SKF, okay? Uh, there are a few companies using 10 to the power of 7, right? Yeah, but we'll consider, well in our case, we'll consider this catalog rating life is going to be 10 to the power of 6, all right? Yeah. So where's 10 to the power of 6? I don't know, maybe it's over here, okay? Maybe it's here. So then you draw up over here, okay? There is a certain load correspond to that 10 to the power of 6, right? And that load is called C10, okay? That's called C10. Mm -hmm. And this C10 is called, okay, basic loading, basic load rating. So this C10 in here, okay, is called, okay, basic load rating. Or it's also called basic dynamic load. Okay, yeah. So C10, L10, you know what L10 is? It's 10 to the power of 6 by default. And C10, you can get that from the catalog. So the manufacturer has done the work, the homework, and it's listed in the catalog for each series for different bearing, you have the C10. So which means what? C10, L10 is part of this equation here, right? And you have F and L for some other loading, some other life. Then what happens basically now you have, okay, this equation. So C10, L10 to the power 1 over A equal to other combinations of F and L. All right, yeah. The A value at here, you take a three for ball bearing, and one third and a ten third for roller bearing. Okay, that's A value. Is that good? So ultimately, this equation, okay, is the whole idea of this bearing selection, okay. Uh, as we're going to say, we're, we're following it here, okay, this equation. Because why? L10, you know what it is. C10, you know what it is. Then F and L is the other parameter. What about the L? The L is probably going to be your desired number of revolutions, right? Let's say the L probably is desired, okay, revolutions or life. 
Okay? Yeah. So there are two basically different directions you can go now. Sometimes the user give you, okay, here's my desired revolutions. Right? Yeah. Okay? And F is the loading condition. You have the shaft, you have the gear, okay? And uh, based on certain free body diagram or the equilibrium equation, and you will be able to calculate the F. So you, you will have the F, you will have the L. So guess what do you do now? You can, the L is this is 10 to the power of 6. You can calculate the required C10, right? So C10 can be calculated as F times uh, L over L10, 1 over A. So sometimes we call this C required. Then you go to the catalog. You go find a bearing whose listed C10 should be higher than the C required. You see what I'm saying, right? And that's going to be a suitable one. Well, there are some other factors, but that's at least one condition satisfied. Okay? So we'll look at the selection details in the, from in the next lecture. Okay?